With that all said, we can start getting into the material for tonight. So neurodivergence and the trans experience. I want to say first that the is a little misleading, right? Because there is no the trans experience. Let's get that said right away. Right? There's trans experience and many, maybe all of us have it, right? But uh, it's different. There's as many different trans experiences as there are trans persons. As is said in the chat by a friend here, we are not a monolith, right? So it says on the screen, the trans experience, but, you know, we, we recognize that that's, that's kind of a fabrication, right? This is neurodivergence and the full multitude of trans experiences, right? We'll have to cover in an hour and 10 minutes or so. <laughs> we'll see what we can do, though. Here's a little bit about me. I know some of you, I recognize a bunch of names in the chat, but for some of you also, this is our first time connecting. So I'll tell you a little bit about me. That's me. I'm Lee. It's not Lay. It's Lee, right? I just took my first name and I cut it in half and uh, ended up with Lee. I teach philosophy at New Mexico State University, got my PhD in philosophy back in 2012. I also administer a neuroinclusive and a sort of queer-centered dialectical pro uh, behavior therapy program through a practice in Pennsylvania called Growth Through Change. I work here as a peer facilitator and educator at Plume. I do the E-plus groups, and I do the 40-plus, the quadragenarian groups. And I'm also the founder of Transcensions Coaching, which is a queer-centered, sort of kink and non-monogamy-informed coaching and consulting practice run as much as is practicable on anti-capitalist principles. So I can give you my contact information if you want to hear about any of that later on. I want to dive more into that practice, but in the meantime... I already said I got a PhD in philosophy. I'm also a certified sexuality counselor, certified through the Sexual Health Alliance. Previously, I was their gender, sexuality, and relationship diversity content specialist and their LGBTQI plus curriculum coordinator. I have been certified through the Mindfulness Institute for Emerging Adults as a mindfulness instructor and also certified as a philosophical consultant, which is kind of like, yeah, think of it as like a philosophy coach for when you're struggling with deep existential stuff through the National Philosophical Counseling Association. But that's all stuff I've done a while ago. Let me tell you about the perspectives I bring through the table and the way that I, the lenses through which I see and experience the world. So I am a non-binary trans feminine person, right? Sometimes I'll say trans, sometimes I'll say non-binary trans feminine person. For me, that's just a difference in how many symbol, syllables I want to utter, right? I am aromantic and asexual, and I see it's already mentioned in the chat. So happy Ace Week, y'all. <laughs> to any aces in any places out there, happy asexuality week to you. Because, uh, yeah, we are very much real and we are very much here, right? I am also neurodivergent, multiply so. I'm autistic and I have ADHD. And I don't really like that phrasing of I have ADHD because it's not a thing I have. It's a way that I am. And I don't think it's a deficit of attention. And I also don't think it's a disorder. More on that in a bit. Though it is disabling for me quite, quite sometimes, right? More on that later on. I'm also, in terms of neurodivergence, I'm, I have visuospatial dysnosia, which means I can't really orient myself in space. So I'm lost all the time. It's a little tricky. I, really, I, I live by my GPS. And last but not least, perhaps most fundamentally, yes, I am trans. Yes, I am neurodivergent. Yes, I am queer. But more fundamental to, than any of that, I am white, right? And that's important to note. So I experience transness, but I experience white transness. I am neurodivergent, but I experience neurodivergence through the lens of whiteness. And I think it's super important to note that because it is a presence and it's better to acknowledge it than to pretend like it isn't there. Because sometimes when we pretend like things aren't there, that's when they really sneak up on us, right? So that's a little bit about what I bring to the table, what I've done, who I am. Enough about me though, because this is not the Lee webinar. This is about neurodivergence and trans experience. Here's our agenda. I wanna talk about what's called the neurodiversity paradigm. I want to talk about neurodivergence and the concept of disability. I want to look at this notion of neurotypicality and spend a little bit of time deconstructing it. We might even say querying it. I want to get into this topic of neurodivergence and gender expansiveness, right? And then I want to end with some considerations of how we can go forward and build a world without masks. If you don't know what I mean by masks yet, you will by the time we get to that section. 
Okay. So that's the agenda. Let's get started. Hmm. We'll start with the neurodiversity paradigm. And so the neurodiversity paradigm, when I first came across it, it kind of kind of was a well, it was a paradigm shift for me. Right? It really changed the way that I thought not just about sort of cognitive development and experience and sensory processing, but about human experience in general, about human relation in general, about humanity in general. Right? And I'm seeing this shift in clinical spaces elsewhere, just like there's been a shift toward queer inclusion and affirmation. There's also this shift toward neuroinclusion. Right? And this real embracing, not just of gender diversity, sexual diversity, but of neurodiversity. And these things seem to be connected, right? At least in my experience and the experience of many folks, there's an overlap between these different kinds of diversities. Maybe, maybe you experience such an overlap too. There's this quote here by Nick Walker from her book, Neuroqueer Heresies. It says, the more I reflected on the process by which I was pushed into the ill-fitting confines of heteronormative gender performance and the process by which I was pushed into the ill-fitting confines of neuronormative performance, the more it became clear that the two processes weren't merely similar or parallel. They were deeply and thoroughly entwined with one another with no solid dividing line between them. And I got to tell y'all, when I read that quote, it was a light bulb that went off, right? But yeah, my whole life, I have been sort of confined by this heteronormative expectation of gender performance. My whole life, I was told I got to be a man. And in order to be a man, got to interact with women in a certain way, got to interact with other men in a certain way. And those interactions were also constrained through this compulsory neurotypicality. This way of being that I was told was uh, the default, the right way to go, right? And we might think at first that those processes are similar. They maybe mirror each other, but what Walker is suggesting here is that no, they're so deeply intertwined that any line between them isn't really a line, right? These might be two sides of a coin or maybe even the same side, right? So let's get a little, a little deeper into it. Here's the old school way of thinking about neurodiversity, right? All this stuff's pretty new, right? But when I say old school, I mean a couple decades back. This idea that autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, others, right? All these ways of being have historically been seen as developmental disorders, right? So they have to do with your cognitive and sensory development, but if you're autistic, if you're dyslexic, this is considered on the old school model, disordered. Right? And disorders are there to be diagnosed and then either treated to quell symptoms or if possible to cure. And under this way of thinking, they are medicalized and pathologized. And y'all, that's just like how transgender experience used to be. Back when gender identity disorder was in the diagnostic and statistic manual and we would diagnose people with basically being trans. You wind the clock back a little bit. We diagnosed people as gay, right? And unfortunately, there were also quote unquote treatments for this. Now we know those treatments are a load of bunk and deeply harmful, right? But the old school way of thinking about developmental disorders has a lot of parallels with the old school way of thinking about queerness, pathologized, medicalized seen as something to be treated or cured. But fast forward to more recent times, right? And by more recent, I mean the last two and a half decades or so. Right? We get this shift to the neurodiversity paradigm, which is rooted in work by Judy Singer. I wanna go on record for anyone who knows that name. I'm including her to give her credit for her work on this. Her views on gender are not views that I endorse in the slightest. Right? Hassan Asasamasu, Nick Walker, who I mentioned already, these are all folks whose work is foundational to what we now call the neurodiversity paradigm. Right? And what that is, is it's a framework that rejects medicalization and pathologization. 
and reframes autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and the others as instead of disorders, they're what we might call neurotypes. They're, they're cognitive and sensory ways of being, and they are natural variations in human experience. They're not defects. They're natural variations in human experience, much like queerness is. So I'm asexual. My asexuality is not a defect. It is a way of being human, right? My transness is not a defect. It is a way of being human. My autism is not a defect. It is a way of being human. Some of the language in the neurodiversity paradigm is really important to kind of be a little precise with how we're going to use some of this language. So sometimes people use the words neurodiversity or neurodiverse and neurodivergence kind of interchangeably, but I want to keep them separate. I think it's important to. So neurodiversity is this word for the whole landscape, right? But then neurodivergence is something a little more specific, though still broad. What it means is to have a neurotype, a way of being cognitively and sensorily, that is not deemed typical or neurotypical by dominant society, right? So society tells us there's a way that our brains, our behavior, our processing should be. To be neurodivergent is to diverge from that neurocognitive norm. And there's lots of ways of doing that, right? If we think of a big circle and then neurotypicality is right in the middle, right? Because that's where society puts it. You could be anywhere, anywhere in that circle. Right? Those are all ways of diverging from the norm. Now, it's important. Neurodivergence not synonymous with autistic. Some people use it that way, but you can be neurodivergent and not autistic. Like if you have ADHD, but you're not autistic, you're what we would call allistic, which means not autistic. You're still neurodivergent, but not autistic, right? Neurodivergence not synonymous with any particular neurotype. It just means you're not neurotypical, right? So neurodiversity is the whole landscape. Neurodivergence is a trait that individuals might have, right? Hmm. So with that kind of on the table, I'd like to raise a question for y'all. And if you would like to answer in the chat, I'd love to see your thoughts, right? The question I'd like to offer you all is, does a shift to a neurodiversity paradigm feel affirming or empowering to you? And if so, in what way? You can go ahead and type your thoughts. We'll take a minute to see, see what y'all have to share. I see yes, but have to think about why. Oh, absolutely. That is totally valid, right? Sometimes you, you hear it and you're like, yeah, that sounds right. But you want to reflect, you want to meditate on it a little bit. And I appreciate that, right? Mm-hmm. What about other thoughts, right? I see. Uh, mm -hmm. So autism runs in your family. Having that lens for understanding that can give us such such a powerful tool for forward movement. See, it says here, affirming, I'm not abnormal, just a different version of normal. I'm the rare drop in the game. Ooh, I like that way of putting it, right? Empowering to not be or have a defect. Oh, lots of answers coming in here. This is great. It's nice to know that I'm a zebra and not a weird horse. That is such a beautiful way of putting it. That's amazing. <sighs> yes, yes. Knowing that I'm not wrong, just different, and that there are people who will understand. Yes, we are here, right? Mm. Yeah, so 100%, but interested in how we can all be neurodiverse. Yeah, so think of neurodiverse as the whole landscape. Everyone's somewhere on it, right? Think about like gender diversity. Gender diversity is made up by everyone, and that includes the cis people, right? And that includes non-binary folks, that includes agender folks, that includes gender fluid folks, that includes trans men, trans women. Everybody makes up that big gender diversity. Same thing with neurodiversity. Even neurotypical people are part of neurodiversity because it's all these natural variations in human experience. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These answers are are giving me life, right? So this is kind of how we'll go through all of the different sections of the presentation. 
We'll give like a little stage setting. We'll do a quote. We'll go through some information and then we'll go into these reflection questions at, at each one, right? So we'll take a, another minute here to see what's in the chat and then we'll move on to part two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea that being trans and, and being autistic are ways of being human. Yeah, they're ways that we are told are abnormal or wrong, but that's the problem of the person telling us that. That's not true, right? Those persons are spreading misinformation, right? Hmm. Yeah, I see here. Okay, so someone here is saying, as a cis-normative person, it's difficult to relate and always learning. And kudos to you for taking the effort to learn. That's what we need from our allies. We need allies showing up, hearing the voices of the communities that we want to support, right? And then amplifying those voices, learning. So I appreciate you for doing that. Absolutely. Right? Cool. So let's go ahead and we'll move into the next section, get a little bit deeper into this stuff. I want to talk about neurodivergence and disability, right? Because I said earlier that I don't personally conceive of my ADHD as a disorder, right? But oftentimes when I'm talking to groups about this, I'll, you know, have someone raise their hand and they'll talk about saying, you know, well, maybe they have a sibling who is a person, like an autistic person who has very particular support needs, right? And maybe they're a person who is nonverbal. Maybe they're a person whose experience of the world is so different from the rest of us that it's so disabling to them, right? And they're like, well, how can I not be a disorder, right? And I want to I speak on that a little bit because I think it's a topic really, really worth thinking about. So neurodivergence and disability, great quote here by, well, I'm not sure which of them actually said it. It's from a co-authored book by Meg John Barker and Alex Ian Toffee, two personal heroes of mine. Fantastic work, read everything they've ever written. Right? They say this, they say, in a world where so many of us are struggling with very real social problems, it's vitally important to acknowledge the cultural context we're in and to resist individualization of of our suffering. I forgot the of there. Sorry about that. And one way to think about this, it's like, think about, think about being trans. One way to understand the struggle, a struggle of being trans is through what's called a minority stress model. Yeah. Trans folks struggle more with mental health outcomes than cis folks. Is it because they're trans? No. Is it because of how society treats trans people? Yeah, right? It's the marginalization, not the identity, right? So yeah, being trans correlates with having a bit more of a hard time with certain things, depression, anxiety, trauma, right? But it's not because of the trans experience. It's because of the trans experience embedded in a transphobic society, right? It's the minority stress model, right? And we can think of that as really, really being a helpful tool, not just when thinking about gender, sexuality, race, but also when thinking about ability and thinking about neurodiversity. Right? So let's get into that. There's this old school way of thinking about disability called the medical model. Right? On the medical model of disability, a disability is a medical defect in an individual. So if I have a disability, it means I'm in some way defective, wrong, broken, scarred, damaged. Right? And on this way of thinking, it is the defect that disables the person in question. Right? So if I acquire a spinal injury that, uh, you know, I, I end up being a wheelchair user for the rest of my life, it would be that spinal injury that is disabling me. Right? That's the old medical model. On this view, with the old school model of ways of thinking about developmental disorders, Autism, ADHD, these are disabilities, these are disorders, these are defects, and it is the presence of the disorder, the disability, that disables the person. So it's the ADHD, it's the autism that disables you. But if we shift into what's called a social model of disability, this is different. Right? On the social model of disability, which is kind of becoming the standard model of a lot of disability advocates. Not all. There's room for disagreement, right? But it's a very popular model amongst disability justice advocates, right? On this way of thinking about it, a disability is socially constructed. It's a way of being that due to lack of support 
and accommodations in your environment, it restricts your autonomy, agency, and action. Right? So suppose I acquire a spinal injury and I end up being a wheelchair user for the remainder of my life. I can't access certain buildings. It's not the spinal injury that keeps me out of the buildings. It's the lack of ramps, right? It's the lack of ramps. If we had the right accommodations and the right support, then our environments would, we would be able to move autonomously with agency. We would, there, we would be there to take any actions that any able-bodied person could take, right? To see this idea of how disability can be socially constructed. Suppose there was a change in the world and everyone started building their kitchen cabinets nine feet in the air. Right? Being short would now be a disability, right? You would be disabled, not because you're short, but because of the way we're building our kitchens. Right? So according to this way of thinking, it's the environment that disables the person in question, right? It's not a defect in the person, but it's the environment, right? The lack of support and accommodations. So if we shift, shift to the neurodiversity paradigm and this social model of disability, then we arrive at this idea that, you know, I said earlier, I have ADHD. It is disabling to me, but I am not disordered, right? Many advocates of the neurodiversity paradigm advocate for the social model, right? Neurodivergence on this is not a disorder, but it can be disabling. It can be disabling when your environment is constructed in such a way to exclude you. Most nine to five jobs do not accommodate folks with ADHD. Most dating scripts out there, you know, in, in whatever dating land is going on in 2024, are not accommodating to autistic folks, right? So it's not the autism, it's not the ADHD that is a disorder, it's these scripts and these expectations that are disabling. Right? So to tie it back into that minority stress model, it's a lot like the way tra being trans can result in mental health struggles, not because being trans is a disorder, but because of the way the world treats us. Right? Or perhaps in the case of neurodivergence, the way the world ignores our needs. So with all that said, I'd like to ask y'all, and you can feel free to be as open here as you want, right? If you're comfortable sharing, in what ways do you re relate to the concept of disability, right? And if you could change one thing about the world to make it more accommodating, what would you change? Right? What would you change? I can say I relate to the concept of disability. I deal a lot with pathological demand avoidance, which is the technical term. Some people prefer to call it persistent demand for autonomy because it's less medicalized language. It comes through, it's a result of autism and ADHD for me. Sometimes I feel so like I lack autonomy in my life that my nervous system freezes up. And the only way I can feel like I'm in control is to not do things that feel expected of me. And that can bring your life to a screeching halt, right? that can be absolutely disabling, right? So when that comes, I see myself as moving in and out of disability, right? And I would say, if I could change one thing about the world to make it more accommodating, I would change the way we relate to time. We take it very seriously and we're on very tight schedules. We loosen up on that, many things become more accessible for many, many people. So that's my thought. Let's take a look in the chat here. Start by educating preschool all about, yes, about neuroatypicality, neurodiversity. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I see another mention of the education there, right? Yeah, education and led by those with lived experience would really, really, really help, right? So nothing about us without us. So we listen to folks who are neurodivergent. We listen to folks, we listen to disabled folks, right? And then we take their recommendations, right? Yeah, something is make people care more about each other. Yes, how many times do we lose accommodations or never have them just because it would be inconvenient or someone else for someone else or not in the budget, right? 
universal health care. Hey, there's a suggestion. I don't know why no one ever thinks of that. <laughs> That's, yeah, I'm a fan. Change that mental illness isn't a dirty word and isn't used against people. Absolutely important, right? I see, not sure how to claim the disability identity. I'll say if, I mean, like any identity language, if it's a lens that helps you make sense of your experience and you're adopting it in good faith, right? Then I think it's one, you know, if if once you think about disability, you're like, yeah, that applies to me. And there's a good faith application of that term to yourself. I think it's a term you can claim, right? It's a very broad term. Absolutely. Right. But that, that breadth is a strength. Lots, lots of more answers here. Redesign cities and communities to be walkable. So we don't need to rely on cars to live our lives. Yes. Yes, walkable with broad sidewalks and ramps would be so nice. So, so, so nice, All right? More patience and kindness and understanding of why ADHD tires me. I feel you so much on that, right? My heart goes out to any of y'all out there who are exhausted mentally, physically, because neurodiverge, being neurodivergent in a neurotypical world just like being trans in a cis world can be so tiring, especially when you've got them stacked together can be so much. Right? I see cutting social cues and communication rules. Yes, really being broad, more broad about that, more understanding. Right? When I'm on a date with someone, eye contact is tricky. I like to be upfront about that, but sometimes that, that makes them feel funny. Right? I then know they're not a person for me. Right. Or a lot of autistic folks will share relations and support by swapping stories. And in an neurotypical world, that's considered to be rude. You're taking the talking stick. Why don't we normalize both practices? Or why don't we just get rid of the concept of normal, period? Right. I see the suggestion that it'd be great to take types of burnout more seriously. Yes. Yes. Autistic burnout, neurodivergent burnout are very, very real phenomenon, Right. And anyone who's who's struggling with it, my heart goes out to you. Normalize info dumping. Yes, it's a love language and much better than the Gary Chapman ones. Right? So great. I love all of this. Let's continue on to the third section. Deconstructing neurotypicality. All right. Hmm. So this is another quote from Nick Walker from Neuroqueer Heresies. Says the concept of a quote normal brain or a quote normal person has no more objective scientific validity and serves no better purpose than the concept of a quote master race. Of all of the master's tools, and this is a reference to the queer black feminist poet Audre Lorde, right? Of all the master's tools, that is the dynamics, language, and conceptual frameworks that create and maintain social inequities. The most powerful and insidious is the concept of normal people. Because the quote, normal people are the ones who are seen as default. They're the ones who come to mind when we use the word people. They're the people at the center of consideration and that thereby pushes everyone else out to the margins of abnor abnormality. Okay. We see that with cis normativity where cis people are put in the middle, trans people get pushed to the sides. We see it with heteronormativity where heter heterosexuality is put in the middle. Everyone else pushed to the sides. To any of my ace friends in the room, we see it with allonormativity. Center the allo folks, push all the ace folks to the margins. And we see that too with neurodiversity. Neurotypicality is centered. Neurodivergence is marginalized. So here's a way of thinking about neurotypicality. On this common understanding, like a really common one, a kind of easy one to slip into. Neurotypical is just another neurotype, but it's like the standard and default one. It's the quote, normal brain, right? As opposed to the divergent brain. Right? And on that way of thinking, neurotypicality is positioned as this kind of assumed factory set setting, much like heterosexuality or cisgender identity. Now, if you're neurodivergent, you might know this term of masking. Masking is when we perform as neurotypical. Putting aside our own sensory processing, attentive needs, 
in order to fit into or comply with the norms expected and enforced by dominant culture. Dominant culture says make eye contact when you're talking to someone. If you're neurodivergent and you struggle with that, you force yourself to do it anyway, you're putting in the work to mask. Right? Perhaps you ground yourself with stimming, repetitive physical movements of some sort. Right? That might really soothe your nervous system, help you get through your day, but it could be seen as fidgeting, which is rude in dominant culture, neurotypical culture. So you mask by sort of smushing down that urge. Right? And for many neurodivergent persons, masking can be exhausting. Why? Because we're putting aside our needs and we're engaging in a performance. Right? It can be similar to the ways in which being in the closet can be exhausting. Any of you who code switch with respect to your gender, right? where there might be some contexts where you sort of present as your authentic self and other contexts where you have to put on a bit of a gender costume, that's kind of like the gender version of masking, right? So I have some friends who are not out to their family. So when they go home, they present as a boy, right? They're not, but they mask as one, right? That's like the trans version of masking for neurodivergent folk very similar notions. And you might even think of masking as a form of code switching too. Right? But here's, here's a way that from Nick Walker, I, 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 I've been influenced to think of this way about neurotypicality. According to this neurodiversity paradigm, to be neurotypical isn't to have some privileged or default factory setting neurotype. It's not to have the right kind of brain. Instead, a person is neurotypical to the extent that they can mask without it being disabling to do so. I'll say that again. Neurotypical. You're neurotypical to the extent that you can mask without it being disabling for you to do so. So that makes neurotypicality to neurodivergence kind of a spectrum, can make it contextual, right? But if pushing all of this stuff down really is exhausting to you, not neurotypical. But if you can push all of it down, if you can mask, do this performance and not really have it cut into your well-being in any way, right? It's just, it's, it's as easy as not doing it. That's what it would be to be neurotypical, right? So neurotypicality would then change based on the dominant culture and what it says are the norms. So it's not a brain type. It's just the ability to conform to expectations without that exhausting, burning you out, disabling you. This makes neurotypicality a social construct as well. So with that all said, I'd like to ask you all, when, if you're comfortable sharing, when do you feel most expected to mask? And what does that feel like for you? Right. One of the things I like about this work here I do at Plume is I can unmask, right? When I'm at my university position, very different context. I have to wear more of a mask then, right? Have to. Because if I showed up as myself in that context, my unmasked self, it would violate so many norms of the, the sort of professor role, right? So it's tiring. Whereas this, I find energizing. Let's see what we said in the chat. See, at work, around family, in doctor's offices, when out about with strangers in public, around new people and certain doctors. Absolutely. So things are moving quickly here. So I'm going to just go with some, some small ones. Around humans. Oh, that's a big one. I feel that. And events in therapy. Oh, at queer events. Oh, some of these are making me so sad to see. Right. See, so one always out as autistic. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, right? Interacting with male coworkers specifically around neighbors in a building, right? And what does this feel like for you all, right? When you have to mask, how does it affect you? Does anyone want to share about that in the chat? So, so exhausting. Feels like going back in time makes me close up feel like all eyes are on me, feel hidden, another exhausting, right? Mm. 
depressing, feels awful. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I want you all to notice as you're seeing these answers come in is that if you feel alone in this, look at this chat, you're not. You're not alone in this, right? This is an experience that so many of us share, this exhaustion, but it can be so hard to talk about because we might think that it's an us problem, but just looking in this group right now of the, the 104 of us sharing space right now, we see we got some common ground, right? It's hard to feel like I'm ever being understood. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but when I feel misunderstood, one of my main impulses is to try harder to be understood by like explaining more. And then that can not go over so well in neurotypical like contexts, right? Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's, I mean, this is, we've, we've talked a lot about neurodiversity, about the social model. We've talked about queerness as we went. Let's center the trans experience now. I want to talk about neurodivergence and gender expansiveness, right? And by gender expansiveness here, I mean all varieties of being not cisgender, right? So the whole broad trans umbrella, whether you claim the tr term trans or not, so we're talking about our trans men, our trans women, our non-binary folks. We're talking about our agender folks, our gender fluid folks, our, ge our bi-gender folks, gender mist, all of them, right? Mm -hmm. I can say for me, these things are very connected, right? I think my, my autism and my transness are not separable. For you, they might be, but for me, they are very much... I don't want to even say they're they're connected because they're they're kind of like one smushed together blob, right? They're not a salad, they're a cake, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense, but it makes sense in my head. <laughs> so Devin Price, who some of you, you may be familiar with his work. If you're not, I absolutely recommend it, right? He says, our hyper-literal analytic minds, here he's talking specifically about large, large groups of like, tendencies amongst autistic folks, recognize that the rules of the gender binary are arbitrary and entirely made up. So making up our own gender identities and rules of presentation feels like a fair game. Identifying outside of the binary also helps us put a name to how detached we feel from society and also from our bodies. And reading this gives me feels, y'all. I am a non-binary trans femme. I am a girl. I understand that there are norms of girl. Long, pretty hair, makeup, particular ranges of voice. I don't care about that because I'm a girl and I want to look like me. And this is what me, a girl, looks like, right? So... I think maybe if I weren't autistic, I would be moved more by feeling, and I'm just speaking in my own experience here, not, not making any recommendations or evaluations of anyone else's experience. But if I were allistic or if I were like fully neurotypical, I might be moved more to present in ways that more people are going to read as woman. But I kind of don't care about that. I like this way of looking like a girl. I think it's cool to be a girl that looks like I do and sounds like I do. So let's, let's get into this a little bit. Numerous studies, right? Numerous have shown connections between neurodivergence and gender expansiveness, right? So it's not just speculation, right? But this is validated by people who research this stuff. In fact, trans and gender expansive persons are up to six times more likely to be autistic. And autistic persons are similarly more likely to identify as trans and gender expansive. So it goes in both directions. If you're trans, you're more likely to be autistic. And if you're autistic, you're more likely to be trans. So it's not a surprise that these things tend to go together. And now the skeptic will say, oh, it's TikTok. It's social contagion. It's just a trend. We know better than that. We know that that is not the correct explanation. Right? 
what it is, is people finding out about concepts that have been suppressed, kept away from them, or simply not talked about, not understood. And these are now tools for understanding that are giving us a richer vocabulary for exploring and identifying ourselves. But why this connection between autism neuro and, and more broadly neurodivergence and gender expansiveness? Like what is the connection here? Well, neurodivergence often complicates our relations with gender norms in terms of both comprehending, maybe you just don't get them, and also feeling compelled to comply with those norms. Right? Like I was mentioning a minute ago, I understand the norms of feminine presentation. I play along with some of it. If you all could see my outfit right now, or you know, these are feminine glasses. I got my nails painted pink and black, right? All that. So I play along with some of them, but I don't play along with all of them. I pick and choose which ones I want to play along with, which isn't really playing along with any of them. It's just doing my own thing. It's just coincidentally, some of them happen to fall in line with the expectations. So I see the norms, but I'm not moved by the norms. They don't feel normative to me. Right? And given the socially constructed nature of gender, it's just unsurprising that there would be such an overlap between gender expansiveness and neurodivergence. We actually see the same thing with other queer identities too, like sexual diversity. Sexual identity is as socially constructed as gender, as, as neurodiversity, right? So autistic folks more likely to identify as non-heterosexual, also more likely to identify as specifically asexual to a pretty high degree, right? Part of the reason I identify as asexual is because and I attribute this to being autistic, I don't know what sex is. I don't get it. I mean, I know what some people call sex, but I, I run through cases and I can't figure out what counts and what doesn't, right? So I don't like the stuff that a lot of people call sex. So I consider myself asexual, but I really don't know what the word means, right? And I'm aromantic. I don't know what romance is, right? Because I've got this hyper literal, literal kind of analytic mind. Um, and it just doesn't make sense to me. So I'm just kind of like, yeah, I don't even need that concept. Right? Again, that's just my experience. But when we look at the intersection of queerness and neurodivergence, we get this idea of what's called neuroqueer. And that can be either a noun or a verb. For some of us, our experience of neurodivergence and experiences of gender and sexuality, like we talked about, are deeply connected, perhaps even inseparable. And Nick Walker, who I've mentioned a couple of times, coined this term neuroqueer, a noun and a verb related to identities or explorations into this intersection. So as a neuroqueer person, what I would say is that my neurodivergence and my transness, my gender itself are not separable. And just like we can use queer as a verb, right? To question, to, uh, to question arbitrary assumptions, binaries, boundaries, right? To scrutinize and then invent new ways of being that are both beyond in between, right? We can neuroqueer things, which is to do that not just with gender, not just with sexuality, but with neurodiversity too, right? So maybe this resonates with you, this idea of neuroqueering or of being neuroqueer, right? If it doesn't, that's cool, but maybe you know someone who it will, and now you have more insight into their experience too, right? So I'd love to ask you all, if you identify as neurodivergent, right? Don't want to assume everyone in the room does. How does your experience of neurodivergence relate to your experience of gender? Right? So what are, I told you about my experience. What are yours like? I see a mention of kink and neurodivergence in the chat. And I also want a second, there's such a connection there. Kink and BDSM context can be so much more accessible for neurodi neurodivergent folks than vanilla context, especially given the sort of clarity of negotiation and also the focus on sort of sensory experience. I've seen some people say that their experience of flogging is a form of stimming, right? And I understand that, right? But other folks say, help me discover the other and vice versa in terms of the relationship between gender and neurodivergence, right? See, it's very confusing. It is very confusing, right? Because uh, it's always changing. I feel like, quote, girl was and still is to a huge extent a, a huge part of my mask. Absolutely. This idea of gender itself as mask, right? Right. 
really something to to meditate on right hmm yeah oh i see the mention of did um, this is my alters a female and i realize that i am in fact trans female in part due to that my question is like the epitome of how i figured how make, figured myself out yes the trans experience and the overlap with did is fascinating right absolutely fascinating right Say, see, autistic here as a kid, I had no idea gender was a social construct that wasn't optional and something you picked for yourself. Even when I was trans, I called myself a boy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Feel like I was drunk and stumbling through life 30-some years, fell ass backwards into gender and my neurodivergence. Oh, my friend, I relate to that so much. I transitioned when I was 35, and uh, yeah, you just put words to to a lot of what I've never put words to before. Hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting to see the thread of kink running through the chat too, with respect to asexuality and with respect to uh, to neurodivergence. There's so much to talk about there. Stay tuned for next month. We might talk about it a little bit at the next webinar. Yeah, more on that in just a little bit. I want to go into the last section, which is a world without masks. Right. Here's another quote from Devin Price from the book Unmasking Autism. Really, really great book. I'd recommend all of Devin's work. To unmask is to lay bare a proud face of non-compliance, to refuse to buckle under the weight of neurotypical demands. It's an act of bold activism, as well as a declaration of self-worth. To unmask is to refuse to be silenced, to stop being compartmentalized and hidden away to stand powerfully in our wholeness alongside other disabled and marginalized folks. Hmm. All these quotes hit me so hard. I mean, that's why I picked them, I guess, right? But this whole idea of unmasking as both a form of activism and as a form of self-worth, a declaration of self-worth. We might also think allowing ourselves to embrace our trans identity is exactly similar. Right? This quote could be about unmasking as neurodivergent or unmasking as trans. Right? We could read this either way. It's about one, but it applies to both. And as Devin Price will tell you, in applying to one, it applies to both. Right? But just like cisnormativity, this idea that cisgender is the default setting and it's the way we all should be. And if you're not cisgender, you're in some way defective or delusional or deviant. Right? This imposes costs and it creates barriers for existing as transgender. Right? My life has gotten so much better since I came out as trans, but I'm a lot more tired. Right? It's better, but it's harder in some ways. It's easier in some, harder in others. There are benefits, there are costs. Compulsory neurotypicality, or what we might call neuronormativity, very similar. It imposes costs and creates barriers for those who exist outside of those bounds. If you fully unmask, dating in the neurotypical world can become really, really tricky, <laughs> right? Moving through professionalism can be really, really tricky, right? Why? Because those things exist to reinforce neurotypicality, right? And when you step out of that or you exist in opposition to it, well, then you're in opposition to that dominant culture. And that's it can be can really feel like a David Goliath kind of scenario. Right? But now in this world of compulsive neurotypicality, unmasking can be a challenging and even frightening act. We might even feel like we can't. Right? But to mask consciously is to take on this challenge head on in much the same way that gender and trans and gender expansive persons take on the challenge of cis normativity head on when they come out and begin their transition. And I really believe this. As we move toward a more trans affirming, inclusive, and gender expansive understanding of the world, I think we can also commit toward moving toward a more neuro expansive future as well. A one where all neurotypes are seen as valid as real and we don't even need a concept of neurotypicality anymore it dissolves right and we just see us as all occupying different locations on a spectrum of neurodiversity without any of them privileged without any of them centered or held up above the others 
we're seeing movement towards this kind of trans affirmation. It's not an easy time for trans people right now. At the same time, we've seen such advancement right, toward demedicalization, depathologization. We're seeing the same thing a little far behind when it comes to neurodiversity. Right? And again, this is not surprising because these two are connected on so many levels. A gender expansive future is a neuro expansive future and a neuro expansive future is a gender expansive future. Right? So I'd love to open up to this question. Now we talked about when you felt that you had to mask, when do you feel most comfortable unmasking? If any of you all want to share that in the chat, when do you feel most comfortable letting that mask go? And what's the experience like for you? Around queer people, at Pride, in my room, and with certain friends. All right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see a lot of when I'm home, when I'm alone in nature, around queer folks. Very common answers here. Yeah. Mm hmm when around people that will share a little bit of vulnerability, they let you in a little bit, you let them in more, right? Around people who know and don't change their demeanor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With my partner, right? Can really only do it with my husband, right? Yeah, for those of you who feel like you can only unmask in some contexts, right? I, I know that struggle. Like I said, there's somewhere I can't. For the rest of us who feel more comfortable unmasking, one thing we can do is we can we can lean into that activist spirit to try to make the world a little bit more accessible for those of us who have a harder time unmasking in broader contexts, right? And any neurotypical folks in the room, you can help us out too by questioning those norms of compulsory neurotypicality. Just because you're neurotypical doesn't mean you got to enforce it on us. So if y'all stop doing that, it gets easier for everybody, <laughs> right? Hmm. So just to recap a little bit, we talked about a lot of stuff. We could talk about a lot more and we will because we got the whole after party social space. But we talked about the neurodiversity paradigm. We talked about neurodivergence in its relation of dis and to disability, this idea that you know, neurodivergence is not disordered, though it can be disabling. We looked at this way of deconstructing neurotypicality. What is it to be neurotypical? Well, you're neurotypical to the extent that you can mask without it disabling you. We looked at the relation between neurodivergence and gender expansiveness. We see this correlation. We see this tendency for one to go with the other and for one to make the other more likely. And what could explain it? Well, this relation or lack of relation to socially constructed norms, right? And then we thought a little bit about a world without masks, including the cost of unmasking, the benefits of unmasking, and maybe a little bit about how we can work together toward making masks a little bit less expected, right? So with that said, I want to offer these recommended readings to you, right? These are just the ones I quoted throughout. Life isn't binary on being both beyond and in between by Meg John Barker and Alex Yantafi. I recommend anything. Well, I recommend anything all these people have written. But this one, Life Isn't Binary, you might think it's just about gender. It goes into so much more than gender, right? Fantastic book. Devin Price's Unmasking Autism, Discovering the New Faces of Neurodiversity. I'd also recommend his book, Laziness Does Not Exist, which is really, really a great one. Learning Shame is another book he put out recently and Unmasking for Life is one coming out soon, right? I see the request to put these in the chat. So what you'll do is you'll actually get an email and a follow-up that's gonna have all of this stuff in it. You're welcome to screenshot in a moment. Screenshot if you want to, but yeah, you're gonna get all of this in the email. And also I'd recommend Nick Walker's, he's actually the person who coined the term neurodiversity paradigm. The book, Neuroqueer Heresies, notes on the neurodiversity paradigm, autistic empowerment, and post-normal possibilities. That word post-normal, fascinating, because it's like, instead of normalizing neurodivergence, let's just get rid of the concept of normal, period. Stop normalizing anything. Because if we throw out the idea of normal, we also throw out the idea of abnormal. And then we just have landscape. Hmm.
So I would encourage you all, if you want, to stay around, stick around, because after we go through a little bit of Q&A, we'll take a quick break. Then we're going to have an after-party social space where we're going to come together. We're going to share, not webinar format, but we're going to be in a room together, and we can talk with each other about this stuff, go through some of these questions, explore and build community. There's a post-event survey here. There's a link, and there's also a QR code. If you can take that survey, that would be amazing. It helps us out so much. It helps me out so much. So please, please feel free to take that. I think you'll also get a link to it in the email. Right? Here are some upcoming events to put on your radar. We got a ton coming up. Tomorrow, Feminizing Makeup 102, right? Then there's a practice space. On the 29th, there's going to be a Halloween drag story hour. Next month, a webinar on breast augmentation, on bodily autonomy, trans issues, and intersectionality, on financial literacy. I need that one. Fashion outside the binary. And then my next webinar with you all on November 25th on trans intimacy, platonic, romantic, and sexual relationships, right? Where we will talk all sorts, talk about all sorts of topics related to that, including getting into the discuss some of the discussion of kink and sort of non-normative relating practices like we're showing up in the chat. If you're ever interested in joining, if you are a quadrigenarian 40 plus, you can join me every other Monday for our 40 plus peer support group. And we have a new cohort of our T support groups, our non-binary support groups, and our E plus support groups starting up next week. I'll be in the E plus support group every Tuesday. So please feel free if you'd like to join that to, uh, to join. My contact info is here. There's my website, my Instagram, my email, and I also have a Patreon where I have links to a bunch of different webinars because I do them outside of Plume 2. I have a bunch of zines that are available, more coming soon, and weekly open, weekly office hours, weekly mindfulness practice, weekly uh, working space. So if you're interested, you can check any of that out. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and... Now I'm big. I'm going to take some questions. We'll do about 10 minutes of questions, then we'll take a break, then come back for the, the social space. And so I'll start by taking the questions that are in the chat, or not in the chat, but in the Q&A box. We got quite a few, actually. So I'll work through those. My apologies if we don't get to all of them, because yeah, there's a lot. Right. So if your question doesn't, if I'm not able to get to it in this brief Q&A part, Stick around for the social space if you're able, and we can chat or reach out via email, right? But the first question we got is, what's the relationship between gender and the ID systemhood? And that's a really good question, right? So for those of you who, all don't, who don't know, DID systemhood, right? So it's dissociative identity, right? And this idea that we have different, different selves, different alters, some of which are driving at a certain time, others are in the back seat, right? But they kind of form a system, right? So there might be two alters in a system, there might be 10, there might be an unknown number. They might have vaguely defined personalities and boundaries, they might be persons with full, full identities, right? And the relationship between gender and DID systemhood, the best thing I can say in response is it's complicated, right? Because I don't think there is one relationship between them, right? It might be that your gender is kind of primary and all of your alters inherit it. Or it might be that different alters have different genders. So the system itself has a kind of emergent mishmash of gender, right? It's going to be very individualized. And our understanding of DID is also rapidly evolving, right? And some colleagues I work with in other contexts are really starting to move toward pathologization and medicalization of DID too, to the point where it's not even DID anymore. It's just dissociative identity, right? Rather than dissociative identity disorder. I'll say Meg John Barker, whose work I mentioned earlier, has some zines on plurality. And there's really interesting stuff there on the relation between gender and DID systemhood, right? So let's see, we'll go to another question here in the chat. So, and again, I'm leaving names out just because this is being recorded. So I hope none of y'all feel slighted by the lack of names. But this question, how do we navigate institutions that pathologize our neurodivergence that we have to interact with? For example, I need to get extensively diagnosed and treated in ways I don't want to receive. I don't want to receive the support I need in my school and workplace. Yeah. This is real, right? 
it's almost like in order to receive the accommodations and support that we need, that we want, and that we deserve, we got to play into the pathological model. We have to go get a diagnosis, right? In my personal opinion, we should diagnose neurodivergence no more than we should diagnose queerness, right? I don't think these are diagnostic concepts. They're ways of being, and we don't diagnose ways of being, right? But we almost have to put our foot into that that regressive system in order to get papers signed so that we can get accommodations, right? And I think one way that we can start to navigate this is first recognize it is the system we're in and we all work together to change that system, right? Eroding neurotypicality, compulsory neurotypicality, it's gonna take some time. Many hands make light work, so let's all get in on it, just like we're trying to erode cis normativity and transphobia, right? but we can make progress. And I think we're seeing progress, right? It's slight, it's incremental, but I think if we look, we can see that there is, has been, and likely, hopefully, certainly will be more progress, right? There's some research that I know of that's forthcoming that shows that uh, folks in mental health programs, like intensive outpatient programs who have an autism diagnosis do better at the end than self-ID autistic folks. And part of the reason for that, that that might explain that is not that there's a problem with self-ID, it's that self-ID folks without a diagnosis are taken less seriously and not provided the accommodation. So one way to interpret that research outcome is to say, yeah, so we should start validating self-ID, not requiring a doctor's signature and give people accommodations when they say they need accommodations right? That would even out that data a little bit. Yeah. So see this question here. So with the neurotypicality as social construct paragraph, are you trying to state that there's no such thing as neurotypicality? And if so, why? With this, are you trying to state that every single earth is neurodivergent? Not really, right? I would say that the whole hierarchy of neurotypical to neurodivergent is based on the centering of neurotypicality. And then everyone else is seen as diverging from a norm. You get rid of the norm and you get rid of both neurotypicality and neurodivergence as concepts. And then we just have a landscape of variation of human experience, right? So it's kind of moving past the whole dichotomy, right? It's kind of like how if we stopped the sort of silly practice of assigning gender at birth, then we wouldn't have cis people or trans people. We would just have people, right? we would have people who go on to discover their gender, right? Similar thing here. Once we get rid of an idea, deconstruct the idea of neurotypicality, realize it's just a social construct, right? Then the hierarchy dissolves. The idea of neurotypicality and neurodivergent both depend on that hierarchy. And now we just have neurodiversity. Now we just have everyone on an even playing field, recognizing some people exist this way, some people exist that way. The question here, do you know if DID alters can present as neurotypical? Yeah. So I, I can't speak with lived experience about DID. I have worked with DID clients. I currently work with some DID clients. And I definitely have seen some where there is this presentation of neurotypicality. But one of the questions that we might have is whether or not that is like a move into neurotypicality or if it's a presentation like a masking. Right. So very, very complicated. And to be honest, I'm not sure, not sure what like the, the ultimate explanation or best framing for that would be, right? Now we probably only have time for about one more question because uh, we want to take about a five minute break before we go into the after party social space. So we're gonna look through here, read the rest of the questions and yeah, so this question, what advice would you give to a neurodivergent person who is just beginning to consciously unmask? How would you approach deconstructing neurotypicality on an individual level? Great question, right? And we'll end on this one. Say, be gentle with yourself, right? Conscious unmasking is a big thing, right? It's a form of direct action and it's a form of self-love. And both of those things can be really hard because dominant culture tells us that none of those, neither of those things are really good, right? 
We don't have a culture that promotes self-love. We don't have a culture that promotes direct action. So you are, in a sense, when you're consciously unmasking, recognize it's going to be a challenge. You're fighting an uphill battle, but it's a battle worth fighting. Right? Seek support. Build, build community, right? So even if you're doing it on an individual level, find a network. And your online network can be as valuable as your in-person network. We often privilege in-person community. Virtual community is just as much community as in-person community, right? So definitely connect with other folks who are consciously unmasking, other neurodivergent folks. Read as much as you can. Add neurodivergent voices to to the like your the feeds that you follow. You know anything that you can do to increase that presence and normalize it for yourself is going to really help you to lean into it. Right. 